Léonie Lancelin, Geneviève Lancelin, dormez-vous, dormez-vous. Toujours pour vous j'ai sué, donc je vous ai tué. Vous êtes morte, vous êtes morte. <laughs> This episode includes descriptions of violent crimes. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to another dark and sinister episode of Prash's Murder Map. I'm your host Prash, and before we get started, I wanted to say a big thank you to all my listeners for your support, comments and reviews. It's amazing to hear from people all over the world, so here's a shout out to Margie from Australia, Jen from Sweden, and to my listener from as far afield as Azerbaijan. A big hello, salam. A huge thank you also goes to my patron, Penny. I really appreciate your support. Before we get started, I'd just like to remind you to stay tuned to the end of the show because I'll be playing a promo for Reverie True Crime, a podcast you should definitely check out. So for the spot that I've marked on today's map, we need to voyage back in time to France in the first half of the 20th century. The city of Le Mans is in the northwest of France, in the Pays de la Loire region, and most people know it for the famous car racing held there ever since 1923. It's also home to Roman walls, a Cistercian abbey, myriad museums, and the birthplace of King Henry II of England. But what the city would rather forget is the stupefying double murder that shook the country to its core in 1933. Leia and Christine Papin were born into a nightmare family to Clémence and Gustave Papin. Their older sister Amelia was born in 1902, Christine in 1905 and Leia in 1911. Their parents' marriage was not a happy one and Gustave had long suspected his wife of having an affair. When he received an offer of a job in another town, Clémence didn't want to go and screamed that she would kill herself if he forced her to move away. Despite her hysteria, Monsieur and Madame Papin stayed together, but their relationship was toxic and troubled. Clément showed no affection for her husband or any of her children, and Gustave became an alcoholic and sexually abused his eldest daughter, Amelia. When Amelia was 10, she was sent away to a Catholic orphanage as her parents had no interest in looking after her. Christine was packed off to live with her aunt at a very young age and stayed there for seven years before also entering a Catholic orphanage, just like her sister. Her ambition was to join a convent later, but her mother forbade it and forced her to get a job to make her way in the world. Why her mother thought she was entitled to dictate what her daughter did with her life after spurning all responsibility for caring for her is anyone's guess. Christine was intelligent and had a rebellious streak. Leia, six years younger, was more introverted. People thought she wasn't very clever, but that was just because she preferred to keep her thoughts to herself and was quietly obedient and loyal. Her fate had been to live with her uncle, then when he died, she was sent to a religious orphanage like Amelia and Christine until she turned 15. It's not difficult to imagine what a negative effect such an unstable family life would have had on these girls, always aware of the painful truth that their own parents didn't want them and spending their childhoods being shipped from place to place like unwanted parcels, treated as a burden rather than a blessing. When Christine and Leia were both old enough to leave the orphanage, they worked in various jobs, usually as domestic servants, and insisting on coming as a pair. They were inseparable, and although they were rarely seen communicating with each other, it seemed almost as though they could read each other's thoughts. They were more like twins and sisters of different ages. 
It's understandable that the two young women were so close, as they'd received no love or affection from their parents, and both felt that the only person they could rely on in the hostile world around them was each other. In 1926, they were offered a place together as live-in maids for the Lonsolan family. Monsieur René Lonsolan was a retired lawyer living with his wife Leonie. Their adult daughter, Genevieve, was married but visited regularly. Christine was hired to do the cooking for the household and Leia was responsible for the cleaning. They sweated for 14 hours a day with only half a day off each week. Although this sounds like slavishly long hours, this was common for domestic servants at the time and without the labour-saving devices of today like hoovers, washing machines and microwaves, keeping house could be back-breaking work. The Lonsolans knew the Papin girls were diligent and conscientious, but even so, Madame Leone was a hard taskmaster and found fault with everything, criticising their cooking and even running a white-gloved hand along surfaces to check for any stray speck of dust. Christine and Leia kept to themselves, spending their little free time in each other's companies in their bedroom, dressing up smartly to attend church every Sunday. Even Christine kept her rebellious nature in check, and they worked hard for the Lancelons for seven years without incident, until one day on February 2nd, 1933, everything changed. By this time, Christine was about 27 years old, and Leia was 21. As far as anyone could tell, it had been a normal day in the Lancelon household. As the two young women scrubbed, cleaned and baked, ignoring their chapped hands, grimy aprons and aching legs, Madame Lancelon and her daughter Genevieve left the house without a backwards glance to go shopping or visit friends for coffee in the bustling town. Regular treats they took for granted, which their hard-working employees could never hope for. At around 5.30pm, the Lonsolans arrived home to find the house in darkness. They were irritated, but not surprised, because earlier in the week a 40 iron had blown a fuse while Christine was pressing clothes, and the lights had gone out. When the repairman returned the iron, he had said there was nothing wrong with it. It looked as if it had happened again, and mother and daughter were angry, as they'd been looking forward to returning to a bright and welcoming home, with dinner bubbling on the stove. The moment she entered the house, Madame Lancelon sharply blamed Christine. We don't know exactly what she said, but as the saying goes, it's often the straw that breaks the camel's back. Maybe it was just one vitriolic barb too many, and the years of putting up with this privileged, grousing family has simply become too much. With no warning, Christine snapped. Meanwhile, Monsieur René Lancelot had arranged to meet his wife at a friend's house for dinner, and he tapped his watch impatiently when she didn't arrive, assuming she'd just lost track of time. Hours passed, and he made anxious apologies to his friends, and rushed home, worrying about what could have happened to delay Leone. The lights were all out and the doors were bolted from the inside, but a glimmer of candlelight flickered in the window of the maid's upstairs quarters. He called out, shaking and rattling the doors, but nobody came. A dreadful sense of foreboding washed over him and he ran to fetch the police. When the police broke into the house, they were faced with a scene beyond anything the most sanguinary, ruthless horror writer could have dreamed up. Mon Dieu, c'est comme un cauchemar. It's like a nightmare. Leonie and Genevieve Lancelon lay dead on the floor, battered, stabbed and bludgeoned, their features almost beyond recognition. Teeth were scattered about the room. The women's eyes had been gouged out. One eyeball was found lying on the top stair and another was tucked gruesomely in the folds of a neck scarf. Madame Lancelon was on her back, with only one shoe on, and her daughter lay on her front next to her, her legs slashed to the bone, a bloody kitchen knife discarded at her side. The walls were splattered with blood two metres high. It looked like an abattoir. 
there's a black and white crime scene photo on the internet which offers a glimpse into how savage these murders were. Even with the low image quality and before the time of colour photography, it's a sickening sight and if you didn't know who the victims were or the circumstances surrounding the crime, it looks so bloody that you might think they'd fallen prey to Jack the Ripper. At this point, police assume the killer was someone from outside the family and that they would find the maids dead as well. Preparing themselves for another horrific shock, they headed upstairs but found the door to the Papan sisters' room bolted. A locksmith was called and when they finally gained entry, they were startled to see the young women in bed wearing just their dressing gowns, chillingly calm and most definitely alive. A bloody hammer had been casually placed on the chair next to the bed, clumps of matted hair still attached. Unable to believe their eyes, police questioned Christine and Leia, and they immediately confessed to the murders, making no attempt to hide their crime and showing no sign of remorse. Police collected the evidence, took photographs, and tried to suppress their rising nausea as they drew sketches of the scene before taking the sisters into custody. It was only when they tried to separate the two that they displayed any trace of distress. Their closeness had united them, not just in their daily lives, but in their guilt. When the Lonsalan women had come home and verbally attacked Christine, something had fractured in her mind. She had flown at Genevieve like a howling banshee and scratched her face, tearing out her eyes with her bare hands. She had then called for a sister, and when Leia beheld the atrocious scene, she leapt in without question, grabbing Madame Lancelon to stop her running for help, and on Christine's orders, gouged out the stunned woman's eyes. Both mother and daughter were blinded. Filled with bloodlust and rage, Christine had snatched a knife, a hammer and a pitcher from a nearby table, and together the sisters bludgeoned the Lancelon women to death. The sisters were so distraught by being kept apart that authorities agreed to allow them to see each other while they awaited trial. Their attachment to each other was noticeably unusual, but psychologists believe their devotion was just sisterly, not incestuous as some people suggested. Doctors concluded that Leia saw Christine as the mother figure that had been lacking in her life and had found both girls completely sane. Although Christine was nihilistic, and exhibited traits of narcissistic personality disorder. Their close relationship had been the catalyst for Leia to join her sister in the hideous outburst of violence, ensuring they would be held equally responsible, perhaps terrified by the idea that only Christine would be taken away, leaving her without her counterpart. This was not the only time in history where two or more people have committed crimes together, or even shared psychosis as a larger group. A captivating example of this is the Dancing Plague of 1518, which also took place in France, where as many as 400 people started dancing in the streets and couldn't stop until they collapsed with exhaustion. Modern psychologists blame mass hysteria or food poisoning from the toxic chemical ergo, which can grow on rye used for baking bread. Similar mass beliefs were seen in the Salem witch trials in Massachusetts of 1692, where superstition and hysteria spread like wildfire through the town so that people really seemed to believe they were being cursed and visited by the devil. The phrase folie ardeur was coined in 1877 to describe shared delusional beliefs between two people who usually knew each other well. Unbelievably, Cases like this still happen today. There's a recent example, thankfully much less violent than the Papan sisters, is disturbing and inexplicable. The Gibbons twins, June and Jennifer, were born in 1963 to Caribbean parents who moved the family to Wales when the girls were young. As the only black children in the community, they found themselves friendless and alienated and as a result turned inwards refusing to communicate with anyone but each other and becoming known as the silent twins. An unhealthy dependence on each other developed and their movements were eerily synchronised, as if they were puppets or robots. They even created their own language, 
which nobody else could decipher. The Gibbons girls progressed to petty crimes like vandalism, theft and arson, and were institutionalised at Broadmoor, a high-security mental health hospital. The pair reached the heartbreaking realisation that their lives were so intertwined that for either of them to live a normal life again, one of the twins had to die. Jennifer agreed that she should be the one to make the sacrifice. Preternaturally, she died very suddenly due to inflammation of the heart, but no poison or drugs were found in her system, and her death remains a mystery. June found the loss of her sister cathartic, and was quoted as saying, I'm free at last, Jennifer has given up her life for me, and she was able to live normally from that time on. Could Jennifer really have induced her own death just by willing it? Whatever the truth, there's a fascinating documentary on YouTube about the silent twins, so I'd recommend checking that out. But beyond the idea of folie ardeur, or shared psychosis, what did turn the Papin sisters into vicious murderers? The barbarity of the slaying was beyond understanding, and for there to be such overkill and mutilation on a first offence is uncommon. The jury only took 30 minutes to reach a guilty verdict. Leia was given a 10-year prison sentence, as they'd felt she'd been influenced by her sister, but Christine was set to face the guillotine, which was commuted to life in prison. The case attracted analysis from socio-political commentators, who argued that the sisters represented the oppressed working classes rebelling against the bourgeoisie, the privileged higher echelons. There's been examples of violent uprising against injustice throughout history, but I'm not convinced this is one of them. The evidence shows that although Madame Lonsolan was not a very kind or understanding mistress, the girls did receive a good salary, were able to live together, were fed good food, the same as the Lonsolan family, and were never mistreated. So although they worked very hard and didn't have many luxuries in life, there was no obvious motive to suddenly succumb to base primal instincts, almost like animals. Gouging out someone's eyes and the extreme violence they inflicted on their employers seem almost inconceivable for human beings who had previously shown no precursors to one day becoming killers. I think the clue can be unearthed in their early lives. In the history of almost every serial killer, or particularly cruel murderer, lurks a dysfunctional childhood. You might remember we recently investigated Sitole, the South African serial killer responsible for the deaths of at least 38 women. He suffered a similar upbringing to the Papan sisters, as he and his siblings were abandoned by their mother and sent to live in youth homes. I believe that in these cases the parents should really be standing trial along with their children. I know that many people grow up in abusive homes and emerge as kind, caring citizens, but some may not have the inner strength, mentality or genes that allow them to rise above their conditioning. What chance did the Papan girls have, brought up by an affectionless mother and a sexual abuser for a father, who dispatched their daughters to other family members because they had no interest in them? A childhood like this will always leave scars. As to why their older sister Amelia apparently lived an ordinary life, that's something only a psychologist could attempt to answer. But mental health issues can manifest in many ways, Violence is just one of those. In prison, Christine Papin had fits and was desperately unhappy, refusing to eat and even trying to gouge her own eyes out. She became increasingly unwell and weakened by lack of food, died in 1937, aged just 32. Leia was released on good behaviour after eight years of her sentence and in 1941 went to stay with her mother under a fake name securing a job as a housekeeper in a local hotel. Her life and behaviour after this were exemplary, never betraying a hint of her bloody past. Some accounts say that Leia died in 1982, but in Claude Ventura's documentary in the year 2000, In the Search of the Papan Sisters, it was claimed that she'd been found in a hospice in France. 
This was never proven as the woman was partially paralysed from a stroke and couldn't speak, dying a year later. Over the years, many books, films, documentaries and even stage plays have been written about the ill-fated sisters. Until this appalling double murder, there had never been such a brutal slaying in the history of France and it left shockwaves and a bloody legacy in its aftermath. If there's a positive arising from this nauseating crime, it's that people began questioning society and starting to understand that children's early lives could heavily influence their mental health as adults. Fortunately, this is now more widely understood, but until society develops to protect children from dysfunctional, damaging family lives and holds parents to account for mistreatment, both mental and physical, then I fear that Leonie and Genevieve Lonsalan's deaths were in vain. You've been listening to Prasha's Murder Map. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'd love to hear from you with any comments or suggestions, so get in touch via Twitter at Prasha's Murder Map, visit prashasmurdermap.com, or simply do things the old-fashioned way and email me at prashasmurdermap at gmail.com. Next time, we'll be embarking on the most suspenseful journey yet as we fly to California's Bay Area to tackle America's answer to Jack the Ripper, one of the most baffling unsolved cases in criminal history. There's ciphers, letters and disguises galore as we conduct a two-part investigation into the enigma that is the Zodiac Killer. Until then, take care everyone. My name is Paige, and I'm the host of Reverie True Crime. Reverie means to daydream, but even daydreams can become nightmares. Come join me and get lost in horrific reverie about true crimes and eerie events. Reverie True Crime Podcast, available wherever you stream your favorite podcasts. (laughs) 